Welcome to Buffer Bloat, shedding some light on this dark topic by demonstration. I'm Jim Geddes, your host. I heard, Daddy, the internet is slow today, at home for years, and almost constantly hear similar complaints elsewhere. I hope the following demonstrations will help you understand buffer bloat and its devastating consequences. Thankfully, you can reduce the pain when buffer bloat's cause is in your house. TCP is the most common transport protocol used on the internet, used by most services, including the web. Buffers are essential to absorb bursts of packets that often occur in a network when fast network links meet slower links. Empty buffers are dark. They impose no delay. It's only when they fill that the delay starts to occur. In the early internet, there was too little buffering, and TCP lacked congestion avoidance al algorithms. For a while, much of the internet stopped working entirely. Engineers were advised to add more buffering to avoid excessive packet loss and congestion collapse, and TCPs had additional algorithms added to avoid provoking uh, congestion problems. But how much buffering is enough? By design, TCP tries to run as fast as it can given the lowest bandwidth link it has in the network path between machines. Any long-lived TCP transfer will therefore fill any size buffers in a device just before the bottleneck in a path. Using any operating system more recent than Windows XP, a single TCP connection will easily saturate or congest a path up to gigabits per second. Other protocols can also fill these buffers. So network congestion somewhere in the path between you and your website is in fact normal operation, not abnormal. The only questions are where congestion is occurring and what happens when it occurs. When buffers are kept nearly full, they cease to be effective, increasing packet loss while also inflicting their maximum delay. They cannot help the data move faster. We must keep buffers of whatever size nearly empty f for best results. Automatic queue management algorithms were invented in the 1990s to solve this problem, but are often not enabled where they are needed, or not even available. All it takes is one uncontrolled buffer before a saturated bottleneck to grow in either direction to ruin your whole day, since slowing acknowledgments in the return direction has the same bad effect as delaying the data packets. You or anyone or any device you share the link with may saturate the bottleneck. Entire networks can congest, filling buffers all over the network. But delay by itself is not a symptom of severe network congestion. Today, it is usually caused by buffer bloat in unmanaged buffers. TCP's congestion avoidance algorithms presume timely notification of congestion detected by packet loss. Besides adding bad delays, these huge buffers destroy timely notification, and other really bad things happen beyond the scope of these demonstrations. I will demonstrate typical home buffer bloat using my home network. There are two common bottleneck links in my home. The broadband connection on this diagram that's located right here, and my Wi-Fi connection. The bottleneck can be in a different link in a different direction and can move as the bandwidth available changes. Depending on the direction data is moving, there are therefore four locations where buffer queues may grow in these demonstrations. Your laptop or device in the upstream direction, your home router, your broadband connection itself in the equipment in your house, or in your ISP's broadband equipment. The ICSI Netalyzer project has gathered hundreds of thousands of tests moving, measuring delay at the internet edge. Each test is a dot on this plot. The colored lines indicate the latency or delay ind induced if the buffers are filled. Multiple second delays are common, as you can see. My service is typical for today's broadband service, and I have over one second of delay. This is well over 10 times the traditional and misleading recommendation for buffering. In this experiment, the queues are in my cable modem. I have 2 megabits per second upstream bandwidth, and we can infer that the cable modem has about a quarter megabyte of buffering. In contrast, this path only needed 4 packets, or 5,000 bytes of buffering, for maximum TCP performance. For these experiments, I'm using a benchmarking tool that flushes the browser's caches, fetches and renders a sequence of pages, and keeps track of how long this takes. I'm plugged into my router via Ethernet. 
so to begin with, the upstream bottleneck is at the broadband connection rather than any Wi-Fi link. I will copy a single file from my laptop to a server at MIT 20 milliseconds away to congest the path. This test is therefore like visiting a new web page for the first time. Everything on the web page needs to be looked up and downloaded. I'll use Google's search page for this test. I will run three tests. No upload. The connection is unsaturated by other traffic. One simultaneous upload competing with the benchmark program. And then one simultaneous upload again, but with um, while hiding the excessive broadband buffering. This moves the bottleneck from the broadband link um, into an artificial bottleneck inside the home router that has little buffering at the cost of significantly reducing my bandwidth. To demonstrate buffer bloat, we'll use Google Search, which is carefully optimized for speed, using a typical broadband connection as shown by the ICSI Netalyzer data. We will run three tests. During the first test, we just run the benchmark on a completely idle connection. As you can see, the benchmark runs very fast, visiting Google Search five times. The results are on the screen. The second and third tests add a single file copy upstream to the identical be benchmark, which is downloading web pages. How fast do you expect this test to run? Just as fast? Half as fast? I let the copy run for 10 to 20 seconds to both fill the buffers and to overcome any speed boost uh, that the ISP may give me, such as Comcast does with PowerBoost. The file copy is from my laptop to a server on the internet. This operation is just like uploading a video to YouTube or Vimeo. Sending an email with large images attached or a video attached is another example. A third example might be backing up your files for remote backup service. With that single competing outbound copy, you can see Google performance is now glacial, through no fault of Google. You might have predicted the performance should be nearly as fast as the first test, but it's not. It's radically slower. Even experts often overlook the damage to downloading caused by filling the bloated buffers in the upstream direction. Trying to use VoIP over this link is like talking to someone halfway to the moon. This really is, the internet is slow today, Daddy, as my family kept telling me. As you'll see from the benchmark results shortly on the screen, the five visits to Google Search now take 10 to 15 times longer than they did during the first test. For the third test, we'll insert an artificial bottleneck that has little buffering by using the so-called QoS features of many home routers moving the bottleneck from the bloated broadband link into a location in the home router with little buffering. To ensure that, that the bloated buffers in the broadband link never fill, I am setting the bandwidth to 70% of the ISP's provision speed. We run the benchmark again while the file copy continues. We are now close to the speed of the first test, despite the bandwidth reduction and the simultaneous copy, achieving performance about what you might have originally predicted or maybe even better performance, given the bandwidth reduction and the copy. The daddy, the internet is slow today phenomena is gone. Reducing our bandwidth by 40% sped up the service under load by a factor of 10. Anyone using a link can destroy performance for themselves or for anyone also using that link when it's the bottleneck link. Remember, this demonstration was on a link of typical buffer bloat. Bandwidth and speed are only vaguely related, as Stuart Cheshire explains in It's the Latency, Stupid. Which internet service would you prefer to share with your family or use at a hotel or a conference? One with buffer bloat or a service of the same bandwidth without buffer bloat? I think this demonstration makes it very clear. What's going on here? There's plenty of return bandwidth, so the browser should have been able to get all its data almost as fast as if there had been no competing copy. Downloading a web page means looking up the hostname and DNS, and then downloading each piece of the page. It takes several round trips to load a page, so delays accumulate. 
Your small uh, web or DNS request or acknowledgement for a packet um, is stuck waiting behind all the packets that have accumulated in the buffers from the file copy. So the browser is delayed a long time, in my case for over a second, for each round trip. When the buffer queues are empty, the same round trip to my DNS server and web server might take anywhere from 10 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. When these buffers were full, the request took over one second. You can see the delay or latency is often much more important to real speed than bandwidth. Selling consumers bandwidth as speed is clearly wrong and extremely misleading. Most people are still using 802.11g Wi-Fi. Its 54 megahertz is a signaling rate. You can actually transfer only a little more than 20 megabits per second of actual data over an 802.11g link. Since most people's broadband service is in the 10 to 20 megabits per second range, and both broadband and wireless bandwidth changes with time, the bottlenecks often shift back and forth quickly between the broadband link and the Wi-Fi link. For this demonstration, I forced my home router to only use 802.11g, and as I now have downloaded a download bandwidth of 50 megabits a second in the second demonstration, the bottleneck is firmly in the home router. There is no competing traffic. This is as good as it gets. I will perform a file copy from my server at MIT to home. Downloading a movie to disk or downloading a large software package would be exactly the same. I will do two tests today using a common current commercial home router. First, the connection is unloaded. Second, the connection has a single file downloaded competing with the benchmark. No vindication is possible short of running an open source router as bandwidth shaping or control of the queues in that direction is not available. I hope to add a third test to this demo uh, sometime soon. The first test is with no competing traffic with speedy disabled. In this case, I'll demonstrate buffer bloat induced by a different machine rather than this laptop. This is Daddy doing in the rest of his house. The second test again visits Google five times while copying large files from my server at MIT. Downloading a movie to disk or copying a large software package such as a Linux ISO image will have the same effect. Your mileage will vary dramatically. If you are far from your router, the effective size and time of a buffer can be multiplied from this demo. Buffering differs between routers quite dramatically. A noisy radio environment can induce packet loss that TCP interprets as congestion, allowing the buffers to drain. Your laptop's device driver may drop packets. We've also discovered serious device driver bugs, particularly in 802.11n. Device drivers may be buffering excessive numbers of packets to try to get good packet aggregation to ma maximize bandwidth. They may also try to transmit pa packets excessively in the face of loss, causing large delays that have the same effect as excessive buffering. As you can see, the page load time increased quite dramatically, a factor of three or more. On top of all these problems, even worse, routine web browsing is inducing transient buffer bloat of order fractions of a second, which can play havoc on real-time applications such as voice over IP or Skype. Again, your small HTTP or DNS request is stuck waiting behind all the packets that have accumulated from the file copy in the home router. So your response is delayed a long time, which can easily become extreme if your share of the Wi-Fi bandwidth drops due to interference, other users sharing the Wi-Fi channel, or being far from your home router, since Wi-Fi adapts its bandwidth to as low as 1 megabit per second to get higher range. At 1 megabit per second, single data packets of 1500 bytes take 15 milliseconds. Having hundreds or even more than a thousand packets queued, which can occur, can cause delays that are seconds or tens of seconds long. I have a big chimney in my house, so I can easily have poor wireless performance unless I improve coverage by using several routers. When I first encountered home router buffer bloat, I saw eight seconds of latency. Until buffer bloat is conquered in our operating systems and home routers, your best bet is to try to ensure as best you can that your wireless bandwidth is always much higher than your broadband connection. By using 802.11n and possibly multiple routers uh, to ensure that the bottleneck is in your, not in your Wi-Fi connection. Remember, Wi-Fi bandwidth is shared among all users 
and also varies depending upon interference distance and obstructions. By using bandwidth shaping, misleadingly called QoS in many routers, which can ensure the buffers in the broadband gear ne never fill, you can avoid most buffer blood problems at the cost of some bandwidth. You may also want to tune your laptop to reduce its buffering to something less insane, if that's possible. If you take these measures, you can usually get good behavior without waiting for the industry to fix its mistakes in your house. Fixing buffer bloat elsewhere in the internet will take time and is out of your control. Stock traders worry about single milliseconds. Gamers wear t-shirts that say latency kills. Playing music with others on the internet require delays less than 100 milliseconds. Good telephony needs less than 150 milliseconds of a delay. With usual single queue broadband gear, Skype or Vonage cannot be 100% reliable under load. Some may say correctly, my ISP's telephony is reliable, but this is because your ISP service is, is usually provided using a separate allocation of bandwidth and buffers, which are not available to competing Vonage or Skype services. Netalyzer's bandwidth upper bound is 20 megabits per second on this test. The lower right is restricted by the length of the test, so the situation is worse than this data shows. Most or all broadband connections, including probably yours, are buffered radically higher than the traditional recommendation of 100 milliseconds in both upstream and downstream. The colors indicate the technology. We have problems in all the broadband technologies. Similar problems are known to exist in other network devices. The powers of two clustering in the netalyzer data also tells us that, that this structure is primarily the broadband link since the home router buffering is measured in packets but it can also often be worse than the broadband link. The diagonal lines show the, the delay or latency in seconds. As you can see from the Netalyzer data, we have immense problems. My thanks to the ICSI Netalyzer team for the use of their data. Various buffer sizes of the equipment are visible by vertical structure. Lack of thought or buffering for highest bandwidth the hardware might ever operate at, along with the misconception that packet loss is terrible even though packet drops are actually essential for TCP to function correctly, has gotten us in this pickle. Most hotels, motels, and conferences are often good locations to see buffer bloat at its worst. Broadband buffer bloat and Wi-Fi buffer bloat in routers and our operating systems in either or both directions at the same time. Let's remind ourselves of triggers. In short, anything that saturates a link. It takes a few seconds for TCP to fill these insane buffers. Thereafter, they operate nearly full continuously. Buffer bloat can cause failures as well as making your applications go unnecessarily slow. Buffers running full induce excess packet loss. Those losses can induce multiple rounds of extreme delays to the point that long delays can even break protocols that presume timely behavior of the network and with low packet loss. These huge buffers also mean the TCP cannot respond in a timely fashion to competing traffic. Response for competing traffic degrades as the square of the overbuffering. 10 times too much buffering means that TCP takes 100 times longer to adapt. Buffer bloat can be so large that people time out before the packets do. The network delivers the packets so late that they are no longer of any use as you've decided to do something else in the meanwhile. Simply adding more bandwidth cannot solve buffer bloat since the maximum needed buffering grows directly with the maximum bandwidth, and today's network links link bandwidths are highly variable. Even Ethernet bandwidth is variable by several orders of magnitude, so the amount of buffering you need is always variable. Our systems currently use fixed buffering and therefore cannot work correctly. The operating systems used in our computers are used in our home routers. If we fix our operating systems, we will eventually fix home routers. The classic automatic queue management algorithms used to control buffer queue length in internet routers do not work well in the face of highly variable bandwidth, such as we encounter in broadband and wireless. They are not enabled in home routers or your computer and would not work well if they were. Some ISPs do not turn on these algorithms in locations where they really should, such as your broadband head end or elsewhere. While simple steps may be taken to reduce our suffering, only automatic queue management can really solve the problem. Packet classification can only control who or what suffers, not eliminate suffering. 
but buffer bloat is present to varying degrees in equipment all over the internet, including our servers, desktops, laptops, cell phones, and many routers and switches in between. Until we fix buffer bloat, our networks will fall off performance cliffs rather than degrading smoothly under load as they should. We have a first-class mess on our hands throughout the internet. Today's demonstration was using the home broadband part of the mess about which we know the most today. But look everywhere for buffer bloat. Help in whatever way you can. At the least you can help yourself and others around you while the buffer bloat problem gets solved. It's grown for over a decade. Conquering buffer bloat may take another decade. For more information, you can read the communications of the ACM articles that have appeared online at the ACMQ website. Thank you for your interest.